in the long run. Oh, shit. No. Say shit because oh, continue, right? Yeah, you're good. No, I'm good. I can't see you. Mark, can no. you there? Can you see me now? No, your video. Let me see if I can un un uh, do your video. No, I can just ask you. Start my. It says start my video. Yeah, that's what you want. I want that. There you okay. go. Yeah. Wow, San Diego. Of, yeah. It always amazes me. We've, we've been talking recently to Australia. I just can't believe it. I'm, I'm still you're, gonna, you're thinking of going? No, we've been talking with an author in Australia. Oh. You know? And <laughs> to me, it's just, you know, I'm still back in the dial telephone days. You know, I actually, <laughs> be, before that, I was uh, back in the um, uh, party line days. And you'd have to pick it up and make sure that... Right. You listen to other people's baggage back and forth. Well, no, you didn't. That was one of the great um, measures of how moral you were. <laughs> that if you picked it up and somebody, you would put it down. <laughs> you right obviously away. didn't live in the country. We were, we lived in Anchorage and we had a party line. And I mean, we just, when we'd pick up the phone, all of a sudden there'd be a conversation going on. And, and, and you would join it? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Or you especially, just, especially if we had a call that we needed to make. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. yeah. But you, you didn't spend a lot of time lurking? Uh, actually, I did do a lot of eavesdropping. <laughs> That's a, eavesdropping sounds better than lurking. No. <laughs> so, um, hey, thanks for putting this together. Yeah. Appreciate it, really. It's, it's fun. And it's fun, you know, especially when you have no idea what, what your author looks like. Yeah. Because you've just been dealing with um, electrons. <laughs> so. Yeah. Now you, it's time to open up the cyber gate. <laughs> so Donna is the tech, tech director here. Hi, Donna. That's me. What? I'm over here on my laptop, completely muted and de-videoed, so we don't have feedback. So I just, you can just kind of see me. So, Mark's so who's, what's Jamie's? I don't, I have no idea. I saw that on the, I saw uh, that. Well, we, we, we send the list out to quite a few people, so. Oh, there's David B. And, and Bobby. Is there's Bobby. Bobby. David Breezer. Is that Breezer? Breezer. I'm trying to get the video Breiser. going. Yeah. After all these years, I don't know how to pronounce your name. I, I, well, well, you're Mark Eastrin, right? Right, right. <laughs> hey, Fred. Hey, Bobby. How you doing, buddy? Good, man. How you doing? Good. Nice. Okay. You're, gonna be kind, you're gonna be kind to me, I hope. Um, I'm gonna try to. I've been searching, I've been searching the thesaurus to find the right oh. word. <laughs> you're looking, Bobby. You're looking a little like Julian Assange these days. Oh, really? Don't you think? Yeah, Maybe. absolutely. There's a resemblance there. Yeah. Be a little happy. less. Be What's happy. that, Mark? I say, be happy you're not Julian Assange. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm in a better place. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to spotlight Bobby and hey, and Fred, so that you guys stay on the screen no matter who's talking. There you go. You're always being watched. <laughs> Your reactions <laughs> are continuously monitored. You're the main event, so. <laughs> and I That's going to be tough on me. <laughs> Emily, do, do, do we need, do really need to do that? I mean, why what? aren't they? Why? Why can't everybody eat be I equal? Spooky. <laughs> well, because it, it it jumps around when there's background noise and stuff like that. So yeah. we can we can take the spotlight away in um, at some point, but as you guys start out. 
we'd kind of like to have you on the screen. Yep. So it's seven o'clock, we might as well start. Um, welcome everyone to our occasional third Thursday. This, this month, we have Fred Rosenblum and Bobby Johnston, who are going to talk about the ways their work, the, the, the parallels in their work that they didn't really know were there until they started talking to each other and reading each other's work. Well, and uh, I, I think I was the one that matched you up originally, yeah. just because your work takes the same format. That is, it's autobiographical poems that are sort of like stories. And um, I thought that you guys would make a good pair <laughs> if you think you'd make a good pair. <laughs> And a couple of other things before you get started. We are recording this, so if you don't want your face in the video, um, turn your um, video off. And um, people um, are, not, are uh, not muted necessarily, so so um, if there's if there's background noise, you may need to mute yourself. Um, and I don't know how you guys want to handle questions or comments or. Interruptions. Oh, so, so what, I, what I was thinking was that I'd start and just give a little uh, synopsis of the two books on it, as far as my perspective. And then Bobby would do the same. Then we'd read a couple of pieces that we'd selected and uh, then take questions after that. Sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good. Uh, the only thing I would say is uh, I've recently seen um, a um, book promotion video that Bobby did, which I thought was terrific. And we don't, you know, use a lot of that because you need the kind of skills and all of those things you see in the background of, of uh, Bobby's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh, but he did a wonderful job. It's not very long, but it's, it's really worth looking at as a species of uh, contact with the potential audience. So maybe we can do that too. Yeah, we could do it instead of one of my stories even maybe, because it is in essence telling a story. It is right? a story, right? Yeah. All yeah. Right. Fred, go, go for it. Oh, okay. uh, are we on the air now? We've yep. been on the air. <laughs> okay. So thanks for the introduction, Mark. Um, on behalf of Bobby and I, thanks for tuning in. We'd like to begin with our impressions of the saint I ain't and playing chicken with an iron horse. Focusing primarily on the strange parallels we've discovered within the contents of these two books. I don't know if you can see, yeah. Mine's full of post-it notes, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so you'll need to acquire both of these to fully appreciate the striking similarities. Follow our synops following our synopses, uh, we'll read some selections aloud before we open the forum up to discussion, like I said before. Um, so my book, Playing Chicken with an Iron Horse, is a collection of poems published in uh, 2019, evoking memories of people and random events I pulled out of my head from five plus decades ago, about a modestly mischievous Southern California kid and son of working class parents who finds his excitement in the wild west of 50s and 60s San Diego County. These poems, while replete with impish delight, alternatively tap into the typically flawed family dynamic of that age, not surprisingly given to the insanity of an era where the lid was about to blow off of the status quo. But in any case, as I state in my preface, this collection serves as a tribute to the magical gift of existence that we all share. And I could honestly kick myself sometimes for downplaying that sentiment. Having recently uh, read a, poet, uh, a portrait of an artist as a young man, and finishing the Showtime series, Ray Donovan, I've undergone somewhat of a Celtic cultural immersion. And now this, Bobby's narratives, which I've read three times, finding myself a captive to his riveting honesty, 
much as I'm a captive to the writings of Tobias Wolf. They're not just randomized willy-nilly willy yarns, but instead read like pared down connected scenes from what I perceive as tantamount to chapters in this boy's life. The Saint I Ain't is a classic American tragedy with its otherwise humorous layers of familiarity juxtaposed to the pall of quote unquote bleak depression of a withering factory town. I have a hard time believing this is Bobby's first collection. Like a seasoned writer, his pieces are crafted to embrace meter, close nicely, and they can be extremely funny. His script reads flawlessly, thanks in large part, I would suspect, to the Fomite team. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> and, and honestly, I couldn't set this book down. Not until I reached the passage that closed it all out, a beautifully measured finale. Trauma, rebellion, and self-destructiveness weigh heavy on the pages of Bobby's forthright stories especially those covering his time served at St. Agnes's parochial reformatory, where the children of doctors and lawyers from Iroquois Heights blended in with the children of blue collar plain folk, factory workers eking out an existence along the banks of the Allegheny River in the 1970s. The Saint I Ain't is also yet another version describing the struggle of faith tainted by repressively sadistic nuns and sexually abusive priests, perpetuating the recurring blight on the Catholic Church's religious order. While Bobby's recollections deserves a higher adult audience rating than mine, we both seem to share an affinity for clarity, not a lot of nebulous philosophical horseshit to plow through. Finally, when I read another writer, I look for something I can gain from them. You know, to improve my own craft, Bobby has gifted me with a renewed appreciation for the art of language, the musical eloquence of this uniquely, uniquely hybridized version of poetry and verse, poetry and prose, excuse me, of his uniquely version of poetry and prose, a stylistic approach that has inspired me to expand on my own signature. Okay, Bob. Dang, I should have gone first, man. You're poetic, Fred. Um, so I have a little something too here. Um, as far as my book, uh, it's, it's a um, blend of poetry and personal narrative is how I describe it. Um, it's like Fred was saying, it's about my childhood. Oh, there it is. Um, it's about my childhood, although I fictionalized, what do they say on the old dragnet? Um, names were changed to protect the innocent and the guilty. Um, uh, so let me, let me talk about Fred's book now. I, I don't have, we can get into mine a little bit. <laughs> um, I first read Fred's book, uh, Playing Chicken with an Iron Horse, when Mark Estrin and Donna Bister from Fomite recommended that we do one of these third Thursdays together. Um, after just reading the preface in Fred's book, I was immediately struck by the fact that his stories ended in 1967 uh, when he went to Vietnam. And I was born in 67, so my stories essentially start there. Um, so it felt like there was a linear aspect to, to our collections. Um, I was also struck by, um, in the same preface, Fred noting that, um, you know, his hometown of Alcatone, Al Cajon has its uh, glory days kind of behind it. And I feel, I feel that that's kind of a theme in my, in my stories too, and definitely in, in my life and my experience with my hometown. Um, and then the very first story references a Jim Morrison lyric. So I, <laughs> that made me start thinking there might be some weird science going on here already. <laughs> um, so, um, while reading Fred's stories, I felt something kindred. Not only were there uncanny similarities in some of the events that take place in our books, but we even use the same language in certain passages. Um, even upon rereading the book, which I did for the third time this week, I still continue to find common themes, which I need to send you that little list, Fred. Um, we're going to be discussing some of these themes and readings from our books tonight, but um, first I wanted to talk about some of the aspects of Fred's writing that I, that I love so much. Um, besides his poems being extremely well-written and funny and provocative, uh, 
there's a vulnerability, a vulnerability to Fred's stories, which give them real honesty and authenticity. Um, and they have a useful energy that kind of sweeps you up. They're, they're vibrant with the perspective of somebody who's living them in the moment. And, and that's infectious and, and disarming. It kind of gives you the sense that they can go anywhere. Um, and although his writing's rich with tactile references, his words engage all of the senses. And um, I feel it's a complete immersion into another time and space and it, and it just takes you there. Um, I wanted to read, just very quick, just some verses. I know we're gonna be reading our stuff later, but just to give you an example of some of this kind of sensory writing, there's some stuff in here that I, I'm just gonna read a couple of little paragraphs, Fred. I hope you don't mind. No. Um, no this one I just love. I'd wake to the dreamy scent of night blooming jasmine and sage. My father would cradle me like a gorilla across the lawn, the scuffs of his worn black work boots sopped with crabgrass dew. I love that one. And then this, um, like cats in heat, we'd beat the stench from the metal trash cans in the street, <laughs> rolling them down the avenues where colonial white doors dripped with viscous licorice wads of charcoal chew, better known to us back then as Thomas Adams' blackjack spit. Um, so you'll see, I mean, his stories have not only the visual, the auditory, but um, there's so much of that olfactory sense in there when you talk later about your father, the smells of your father and that kind of thing. Um, that's something that, that I just really got swept up with this. And then um, I also love the relationship with Fred's families in these stories. And like me, he had, he had some things with his father, but there's also real genuine like touching and warm moments there. I love the, the story when you're playing a game with your grandmother, I won't say how it ends, but um, the ending of that story is so touching. So, um, I think that th th those create a nice juxtaposition to the mischief and hell raising that's going on in the stories. But um, yeah, so, you know, now I think we can get into some of the strange parallels we were talking about. I didn't know you were linearly, uh, the, the poems, <laughs> you know, I didn't know when you were born, let's put it that way, <laughs> Bobby. Yeah. And, and that your birth, picked up exactly on the end of, uh, of uh, Fred's poems. Yeah, I, I had a feeling maybe Mark was sitting home putting this together like, <laughs> wait, till they, <laughs> wait till they realize. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it really blows my mind how many similar experiences we cite through our stories and poems. Yeah. So many. We had lunch, the other, we had lunch the other day, right, Fred, and we had a list of we had so many options for things to read and I think we narrowed it down to some. And you know, I looked over it again today and there, there were more. Yeah, it's funny. And maybe it's a couple of boys' lives, but I mean, they are, the stories are separated by a couple decades. So it's, it's pretty. Yeah, uh, I, I wasn't quite as uh, drug educated as you were at, <laughs> at, at your age. Yeah. I think another big difference is the nuns uh, and everything that they represent and the institution that they are um, facing, you know, the face out of that uh, nun institution is really different from anything f Fred, maybe, I don't know. I, the, only, the only exposure I had to that sort of a deal was uh, I went to summer camp at a, at a, a Catholic uh, uh, it was just a Catholic run uh, summer camp for, for kids. And I, I, I mentioned that in one of my poems, I forget which one it was now. But you didn't have a, uh, I assume Rosenblum is Jewish name. Right? Yeah, but I wasn't raised a Jew, I was raised a Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> you, you put that in your footnotes a little bit that you took a liberty with, was it the Seder plate or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway. But I mean, we both have a, a had a wound for for truancy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, Definitely. Uh, the reference to the female breasts as generous gifts. We both. That's the that's that one really jumps out at me is that we both use the the term generous a generous gift for the <laughs> fact that uh, we were allowed to. Uh, to, to, to see those beautiful, uh, yeah. Sentiment of the whole human race, Fred. Um, uh, but uh, 
Yeah, you know, and also uh, <laughs> we created scary outdoor fires. <laughs> yeah. Um, we had some mischief with uh, pallet guns. Uh, yeah, um, what's, the, what's the other one we were talking about? Uh, we both allude to the shootings that occurred in our alma right. maters, our high school alma maters. Yeah, our high schools are known for school shootings in a time when it wasn't really a common thing. When did that happen at your school? I know it was later, right? Uh, I'm going to get this. I wasn't going to school at that time, but uh, I think that it happened in the 80s at hmm. some point, the Santana shootings. Yeah. Santana High School shootings. It was yeah. after the call all the Colorado shootings. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that was the first one we were going to read is the one that uh, kind of the... Uh, what I call my high impact childhood. And you have a couple stories in there that have a similar thing. Uh, there's one where you're skateboarding and spring your injuries upon your mother, like I reference in my book. And then the Grisby kid had a, we, we'll see those similar things. That's, you wanna... that's a pretty outrageous parallel, I thought. Yeah, the one in these two. And you guys you guys can listen for it here. But um, yeah, do you wanna go first, Fred? Okay. Okay, so it's the Grigsby kid. The Grigsby kid was a hard luck kid. Mom and I stood at the kitchen window, listened to the screech and thud of anatomy collide with an automobile. A sound outside that would ever echo a frightening keepsake from my childhood. Standing just beside her and tugging at the postmodern print of an apron tied to the waist of her cotton day dress in gingham, broccoli, pea pods, and red potatoes, corn stalking the minefields of juvenile tragedy. I held a fistful of mother's vintage kitchen attire, trying to get her attention, but lost in a far off vision, all she could image beyond the old purple caddy was the broken body of her year seven child the blood from my ears pooling in the street. One year later, the same little boy, the Grigsby kid, not me, having mended, would slam a gothic windowed door, the pain of which would shatter, and the shards would slash his arm like pie dough rolled into a swirl of raspberry batter. That be that. Yeah. I love the swirl of raspberry batter. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my, my, my poem that we, we felt a, a kindred thing in there is called Sweet Sympathy. I had a high impact childhood. Our neighbor, Mr. Hinckley, used to joke that if I lived to be 12 years old, I'd make it to 100. My laundry list of accidents and injuries would have filled a medical journal. But even with the solid foundation rooted in the classics, Cracked teeth, broken fingers and toes, fractured collarbone, broken foot, splintered elbow, and a nose that had been reshaped more times than an amateur boxer's, I still found new invented ways of attracting trauma. There was the time I ran arms extended through the plate glass of our front door, leaving my hands bleeding as if they'd been thrust into a bucket of Ginsu knives. Another time, Billy Flynn and I attempted to surprise Mr. Hinckley by removing a tree stump from his backyard. This ended with Billy's first swing of the ax, which completely missed the stump, yet struck squarely against my skull. But my piece de resistance had to be the morning I tripped while running with a hollow tent pole. I defied the odds of both physics and chance by landing with the aluminum pipe going straight into my mouth, lacerating my throat and slicing off half of my uvula, never to be seen again. This sent me bolting toward the house, screaming and spewing blood like a pint-sized Gene Simmons. These catastrophes were routinely sprung upon my dauntless mother, who was adept at applying critical first aid, and unsurprisingly, would later become a nurse practitioner. But being poor in the 1970s meant that very few injuries resulted in a doctor's visit, and even less in a trip to the hospital. My father's patent response to statements like, my arm moves when I move it like this, was to say, don't move your arm like that. 
He had little tolerance for garden variety maladies since my older brother had already been through a half dozen surgeries for birth anomalies by the time he was five years old with many more to follow. I spent countless weeks of my adolescence at my grandparents' house while my mother and father accompanied my brother to the big city where he underwent painful and traumatizing procedures. But what I noticed most about the experience was the outpouring of love and support he received from friends and family. There were balloons, cards, stuffed animals, and the kind of receptive embrace that a troublemaking kid like me could only dream of. I had vivid fantasies about the girls from St. Agnes Grammar School visiting me on my deathbed, distraught over the fact that they had overlooked me for so many years. Every time I had a medical emergency, I wondered if it was finally going to be the big one. My second concussion would ultimately be the event that landed me in the hospital for an overnight stay, likely because I had projectile vomited all over my desk during science class. Once I was settled in my room, I asked if we could call my brother to let him know where I was. My brother was appropriately and unimpressed, especially when he heard the concussion was caused by losing my grip while swinging from the pipes in the boys' bathroom and landing on the concrete floor. He said nobody was going to come visit me just for being an idiot. The next morning, I woke up with a massive throbbing headache and debilitating nausea. But alas, no balloons, cards, stuffed animals, or sweet sympathy. Yeah. Now that might be the funny, that's a, like the funniest line for me in your whole book is uh, don't move your arm like that. Yeah, you said your that's dad. It, yeah. Yeah. I think that might be a classic dad one right there. Um, yeah. And I believe my mom's probably on this Zoom, maybe. Um, but yeah, she is a, a nurse practitioner. And, and you have another story in there where you, uh, I think you should read, we, we should look at that little passage. If you, maybe not, you know, unless oh, you, I'm not sure if you want to. Hills? Yeah, the Cathedral Hills, that's a great one when you, yeah. I'll read that one. Okay. That'd be page 62. Mm -hmm. Okay, Cathedral Hills. A few years prior to the urethane skateboard wheel designs, it would surface out of the sidewalk surfing craze, like the bitchin' candy apple paint jobs of the Mustangs and Stingrays. We'd take apart our metal skates, the ones with the key on a spring, Nail the, metal roll, nail the metal rollers to the crudely hewn slabs of dug fur, a rip saw with my dad kept good work. With or against the grain, any and all projects requiring a saw back in those days. We'd spray paint these banana boards splayed across the editorial pages of the UP, masking tape them to a cold garage floor, model airplane decaled them, squirted them with the oil of three and one for cutting the ball bearing sludge, a mixture of afternoon humidity and the dry valley dust. The first board I made was a Pepto Bismol pink, had black jet had jet black polka dots, and was the same plank I had my accident on up at heat. Cathedral Hills. Out of boredom for the pendulous motion, I had decided to challenge myself and abstain from the slalom up there. So I altered by opting to a downhill bearing, resulting in an imperative to bail. This was due to the intrepid shuddering of increased acceleration, probably 15 miles per hour, a speed from which I'd leap and spill off into a spider leg sprawl, leaving the flesh of my elbows and knees on the asphalt as I crawled off the street. All the way home, I wailed like a child on fire, looking for a lake to jump into. My mother cried too. Jesus, honey, a bloody mess. I, she took me home into the bathroom. She took me into the bathroom, immersed me in a cold tub of water, and after I had dried, she applied mercurochrome and bandages. What a burn and a bummer. I gritted my teeth but couldn't stop crying. And my mother poured me a shot of bourbon, a neat little glass of amber nectar that had me gasping 
and she didn't balk when I breathlessly asked her for another measure to deal with those pulsing cutaneous embers of pain. Nice. You said your mother was on this. Um... I think she is. She better be. No, skin. Yeah, she is on here. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> hey, mom. Is that Emily? Uh, Julie McCann. Oh, Julie. She's probably muted. Oh, I don't <laughs> even see Julie, but. Hmm. Okay. Looks like she's muted on there. Do you see the old participant? Hello, Bobby. <laughs> oh, there she is. Hi, mom. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, what else are we looking at reading, Fred? Um, yeah, I'd like to read the best poem I ever wrote. But yeah, I want to hear that one. I like that one. The but, grace you know, right now, I got a big blank screen in front of me. I don't know what I did. Fred, can you be a little closer to wherever the mic is? Yeah, but you won't see me anyway because I'm blocked out by something huge here. I see you fine. I we, even see the painting behind you. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's big city, they call that. <laughs> um, yeah, talk about it. What is happening here? This is better, this positioning. Okay. I, I, I'll just read. I can't see myself, but you know what you look like. <laughs> so I'm going to page 29. Yeah. This is a, hey, you know, this is a long poem. It's five, like five pages. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah, it's, called, a, great, it's a great poem. Yeah. Uh, Gray Cedar Farmhouse Weekend Sleepover. These people, the Roonies, were dear to me. Rex, the patriarch, was a greyhound dispatcher and the sire to an Irish clan of howdy-doody redheads, one of whom I'd shared a bed with, my friend Mike, the freckled son and nail biter, impersonator of the Vern Gagne vice grip trademark sleeper hole. His jockey shorts were streaked with the Siena Buck Sergeant stripes of an 11 year old in a big hurry. His bed was dirtier than mine, had an odor of other than me. His linens were stiff with far too much starch and gritty. Downstairs, the Rooney like livestock slumbered. They woke and broke me from my dreams and silence with the Morse code of apnea snorts. The day before, we'd played on boulders off of Pepper Drive and Tuttle Lane, miles from our separate schools, but mere minutes from our dentist, whose atrocious halitosis seemed a far greater infliction than his practice of no Novocaine drilling into raw nerve. We'd spied on him in his basement applying small, taut rubber bands to bake ceramic molds one of them a model of my large rodent overbite, a replica of my stupid grin, all jackal-jawed on a workshop shelf, seated next to the myriad and equally stupid adolescent grins in his menagerie of hysterical malocclusions. And on that day, we ran like tumbleweeds pushed by the wind, chased by a small pack of snarling hounds into a grove of rotten shimmy pools, following our taunts to a wallowing drift of squealing pie train hogs in their pins. And when we, further upon a warren fell, that element of surprise had the jump out of jackrabbits put a spark to our spines. With a few of Mike's lazy summertime pals who'd merely tagged along, we hid in the hillside rattlesnake sage one set of binoculars for the four of us amid uh, aimed on the volleyball nudist at a weekend nature retreat in a canyon past cottonwood and molting eucalyptus. The security, an unclad enforcer, secured his lopsided testicles with a shroud of camouflage loincloth, chased us with a BB rifle and a battle cry. While the crippled kid among us, oblivious to his handicap 
of schlepping a defective limb, kept himself abreast of our flight, fueled by super jolts of adrenaline. From the dust and the broken sage, our terra firma, exodus of this boyhood planet playground of granite undulations, its slightly, its slightly acrid sap of trees coalesce with the scent of freshly painted stables where an old snag would hose us down with a wrought up blast of equine sneeze. Our evening meal of meatloaf took respite in a tulip field, dressed in the, in the classic ketchup glaze, resting there where windmill veins churned mead turned peas and mashed potatoes on the glossy blue and ivory semblance of Delftware plates. Under the rosewood dining table, our filthy naked played out feet luxuriated in the spinal shag of the Rooney's spent mutt rusty, a geriatric at 13. I remember hiding my peas in the mashed potatoes, the method by which I eat them today Mike's younger sister, Kathy, always thought that I was so damned clever and cute for the slightest innovations I'd introduce. At 11 years old, it made me uneasy, but queasier yet was I when I stepped barefoot on one of Rusty's furtive landmines. The serpentine coil of the old dog's dump gave like a well-cooked candied yam hidden beneath a veil of Bermuda grass clippings. I could not wash that foot enough and the release of the god-awful smell. Mike began bleeding from the exaggerated lip-stretching laughter he'd been avoiding for most of the day. A chronic condition he'd acquired, required balm be applied whenever we'd play. Mike and I would continue to comb the hills of Santee and El Cajon for a few more years, chucking rocks at squirrels and metal arcs, jackrabbits, and the presumably abandoned warehouse windows near Gillespie Field. Hell, we shook the hand of LBJ in 1960 at a rally the Dems had held out there. It was all banners and brass and the lady bird. Lyndon even wore a 10 gallon hat, which was slightly absurd on account of the decorum seemed contrary to running on the ticket with JFK. It was all the free weenies we could fit in our gobs. Mike naturally woofed down five of those dogs far too quickly, puked into a box full of campaign brochures, declaring a new leader for the 60s. I pedaled home on my huffy, pumped my cruiser up the verboten Cuyamaca Street, where I glimpsed my dad in the picture window waiting to tan my ass with his work belt. Rex, Rex was granted a transfer and moved his family to Phoenix. They put old Rusty down when his legs gave out. That was the end of our hijinks, Mike Rooney and me. I heard his dad got him a job as a baggage handler in the inferno of Tempe, or was it Mesa? Slaving in the oppressive heat before he'd turned 21 but a lot of us bad boys would enter the gates of hell in 68. All I got on that one. <laughs> I don't know. Nice. nice. Why do you think that's your best poem? Why do I think it's my best? It's a, I, I don't know. It's just my favorite. And what makes it your favorite? I'm getting at, it's, you know. It, it just, it just takes in so much. And I think that, I've expressed it uh, so well. They just, I don't know, it hits, it, it, there's so much, there's so much that it captures. Um, it has that full sensory thing too that I was talking about all through it. It's amazing. And maybe because I'm in California now, I can, I can go right there too though. I mean, it captures that California thing so much. Oh yeah, the terrain, the all the yeah. 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 Nice. And I think my kindred one to that I was gonna read is a uh, seventh heaven, right? Okay, yeah. Seventh heaven. Oh, okay. 
Crossing the bridge by our house led to two places before continuing out of town. One was Mount Seneca, where every kid from the south side went for unchaperoned adventure. And the other was Iroquois Heights, which my father referred to as Snob Hob. Nobody from Iroquois Heights worked in the factories or labor shops and their names often had abbreviations attached to them, starting with DR or ending with ESQ. Most of my friends from St. Agnes lived there. Mount Seneca's distinction was being the highest point in the valley and being covered in dense forest. At the very peak of Mount Seneca was a mythical place known as Seventh Heaven. We used to listen avidly as our parents would reminisce about Seventh Heaven over backyard picnic tables. They spoke of it being an amusement park when they were kids and said you used to be able to see the Ferris wheel lights from all the way in town. Long before us younger kids had ever made it up to Seventh Heaven, we heard accounts of older kids returning from explorations of weed colored roller coaster tracks, rickety fun houses and rusty bumper cars. By the time I reached the peak of Mount Seneca, I was in fourth grade and the legendary Seventh Heaven had joined the shuttered factories on the north end of town as fossilized skeletons of our city's glory days. All that was left were vestigial concrete foundations of ring toss booths and shooting galleries. In fact, Seventh Heaven had never stopped being a shooting gallery. On our first trip to the top, we spent hours exploring the myriad of bullet holes that had been left in anything solid by generations of juvenile marksmen. We put our holes into every, I'm sorry, we put our fingers into every hole like little doubting Thomases, yet to experience the marvelous power of firearms. It was a glorious day at the beginning of sixth grade when Paul Verducci walked into St. Agnes and announced he had received a pump pellet gun for his birthday. Paul was an awkward blend of Ichabod Crane and TV's Gilligan with a bit of Eddie Haskell thrown in for good measure. He needed a gun like Caesar needed a Brutus, but Paul lived in Iroquois Heights and there wasn't much he wanted that he didn't get. Besides, kids from the South Side weren't particular about their past to mischief. By first recess, Billy Flynn and I had arranged to take Paul Verducci and his pump pellet gun up to Seventh Heaven for some target practice. The pump pellet gun was a revelation because of the hinge pump on the barrel stock, which increased its velocity and made our BB gun seem like pea shooters. With 25 to 30 pumps, the pellet gun would easily kill a small animal. We spent the afternoon on Seventh Heaven shooting at anything that moved and many things that didn't. By the end of the afternoon, we had become adept at applying 30 to 35 pumps by two of us holding the barrel while the third worked the pump with both hands. Before we started our descent down the mountain, we decided to pump the gun to its pneumatic limit in case we encountered a renegade squirrel or free-spirited sparrow. On the pathway down, the lack of live targets and simple juvenile waywardness led Billy into his assumed role of Paul's antagonist. As Billy began throwing acorns at the back of Paul's head and poking sticks into his shoulder blades, I began to feel like Moe trying to keep Larry and Curly in line. It soon became clear to everybody but Billy that Paul had finally had enough. Paul turned and pointed the gun in mock defense as Billy released one last acorn. Paul dodged to avoid it and lost his footing on the dirt path, and the gun went off. The silent shock on Billy's face and the telltale hole in his pant leg subtly announced that the round had hit his mark. Billy slowly slid to the ground and gasped, Paul shot me. Despite concern over Billy being wounded, the three of us immediately discussed consequences. We knew the mishap would surely lead to the confiscation of Paul's new gun, so we agreed to deal with the situation on our own. My obsession with my mother's nursing journals, they often displayed incidental clinical nudity, and vast knowledge of TV medical procedures led to my appointment as mountaintop surgeon. I sent Paul home for rags, tweezers, and alcohol and helped Billy hobble to an abandoned structure on the hillside where I could examine the wound. As I pressed on the skin above Billy's knee, I could see the shiny tip of the lead pellet lodged behind his kneecap. Upon Paul's return, I poured a capful of alcohol on the hole and began digging with the tweezers. After a few minutes of futile exploration accented by Billy's plaintiff wailing, we decided to bite the bullet and take him to Paul's house to confess and seek proper medical attention. The consequence of our better judgment would be the affirmation of our worst fear, the loss of Paul's gun privileges and our return to fishing poles, leg hold traps and our own side of the river. Yep, that's all I got there. <laughs> Those are kind of long ones. Yeah. Okay. So what else did we have? Did we, were we going to read another one? Uh, 
or do you think we should get questions? What do you think, uh, Mark, with the time? Uh, we have another 20 minutes. All right. And um, it's up to you. I mean, you guys are running the show. Every one of these is different because we don't tell anybody what to do. So, <laughs> so people have different ideas about how they want to use a third Thursday there. Yeah. Kind of Zoom format. You know, um, <clears throat> Bobby, I think you should read The Saint I Ain't. The first one? The opening piece? Yeah. Or, oh, The Saint I Ain't? The Saint I Ain't. Not I, I was thinking um, also... I could read Ben and you could read the Hotel Cecil. Um, well, you could read what? I could read the Ben story and you could read the Hotel Cecil as well. Um, Ben's like the old guy that stayed at that hotel that we used to go to and drink when we were kids. Okay, go for it. Are you, do you feel like reading the Hotel Cecil too? Sure. You want to read that one? Maybe you can go first and then I'll read this one. Okay. I mean, what page is that? <laughs> Hotel, I love Hotel Cecil. Hold on. It's, um, I'm not trying to dictate what you read, but I think these two have some, um, you know. Page so. 10. Damn. What page is it? 10. 10. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I was, I don't know. I was, my brother and I were like nine and 15 or, or nine and 14 when this happened. Uh, the Hotel Cecil, or Cecil. Uh, what, what we were doing in downtown LA in 1962 was far from the shallows of my recollection. The 1920s flare of stone facades and majestic marble columns were in eerie contrast to the peculiar placement of its wrought iron fire escape fronted. The Greyhound station wasn't far away. They'd put my dad up there for the night on many occasions. He'd driven to and fro for so many years out of San Diego, drove one of those swift scenic cruising machinations. From the inner, inner city outer limits across the nation, yes, the depot wasn't far from the stay on Main, or better known to the downtown locals as the Suicide Cecil. Nearby 8th Street was Skid Row for which my father always had a strange fascination. One that he passed on to my brother and me, ergo our would-be obsessions with the Beats, Ginsburg, Ferlinghetti, and Bill, the celebrated urban junkie Burroughs. The hotel of 600 rooms or so had been the focus of copious, terrible atrocities, serial murders, rapes, dismemberments, etc. But most infamously, it owned the reputation of Suicide Central. To wit, a young woman had just leapt from the window on or above the room that dad had booked for Jerry and me up on the ninth floor. And to make matters worse, she'd lit on another, landed directly on a passerby, resulting in a collateral mishap, sort of a, an immediate mortal encore. Most of the dwellers there were transients, eroded no doubt by addiction. They were hopelessly lacking in a future of any quality to speak of. I can see now how suicide might have been an appropriate option for these, the walking non-fictional dead. As frightening as the whole experience was to us as children, holed up in that seedy little room for the night, a crazy old man of a sire still felt the urge to further intensify our angst when he decided to perform his version of a groveling drunk, twisting the knob of our chained, albeit unbolted door. Dad in the hotel hallway, slurring the words, let me in. The chilling din of his bedraggled gait, scraping the foyer floor. That's that one. I like that one. Thanks. All right, I'm going to read uh, Ben. Let's story here. They say Ben doesn't drink anymore, but he's already put in his miles. When I was 14 or 15 years old, I began the sacred ritual of going to Ben's house for beer. 
my friends had told me many times about Ben's house, Ben's stories and drinking beer with Ben, but this was my first invitation. I was expecting a middle-aged Robert De Niro in a smoking jacket with searching eyes and a brush fire wit. Then I met Ben. Ben had the withered visage of a scarecrow with no front teeth and a pale film cloaked right eye that had been demolished by a mop handle when he was in the army. This happened during a drunk barracks fight, which also cost him the aforementioned front teeth. Ben lived in the bottom back apartment of a rundown hotel that was filled with old time pensioners and disabled vets. The entire place smelled like the one corner of a house where a cat likes to piss if you leave it alone for too long. The walls were painted in a dingy hue that fell so precisely between blue and green that its true shade would become our favorite object of bet and conjecture. The nightly activities at Ben's, drinking and teen bullshitting, would take place in his dimly lit smoky kitchen where the cabinets were plastered with pornographic photos and clippings of dirty jokes. I thought that kitchen was the coolest place I'd ever seen. Any night Ben could be found huddled over his kitchen table, drinking beer and straightening the smokable portions of crust cigarette butts. At Ben's, the beer rules were simple. You'd buy, he'd fly, except once a month when he got his disability check. Quantity over quality, no beer left the apartment. And most importantly, any unfinished beer was poured into the pitchers in Ben's fridge for his daytime drinking needs. Pouring wounded soldiers into the sink was unforgivable. It was in Ben's kitchen that my friends and I talked about conquering the world. My story was about becoming a famous musician who dated the most beautiful women in the world and spent money freely. Whenever I finished talking about it, Ben would let out a wide open throaty laugh, which would lead into a coughing spasm. Then he would say that he was gonna know I had hit it big by the truckload of beer I would send to his back door. Then Ben would smile at me and wink with his good eye. There it is. You think we should take questions? Yeah, let's do that. All right. Do we have any questions uh, for anybody? Yeah, I have a question for David Breezer. Right. Okay. Uh, Riser. Riser, yeah. Um what I'm, I'm not any I'm revealing anything that that isn't public but david used to be the editor of the journal of addiction he's a medical doctor huh and i'm wondering what you think about um how frequently addiction seems to pop up as a poetic subject right uh I had the same uh, thought as I was listening to this, to, the, to these uh, pieces. And I think uh, there's a, uh, I have a lot of thoughts about this. I, I thought the, the pieces you read uh, were in a sense fueled by the frequent pit stops at cigarettes and beer and uh, uh, BB gun cartridges and so on. And um, I think that's a uh, device that, uh, like, you, like you're suggesting, uh, occurs really frequently in film, in writing, uh, in, in popular, in songs. Um, and why, why that is, uh, I'm not sure. Like last night, I was I was uh, reading the uh, final pages of uh, Nightwood by Juno Barnes, which is yet another uh, amazing uh, uh, prose experiment that uh, dips again and again into the drinking and salaciousness and uh, uh, nonstop. Uh, you know, uh, inebriated hooliganism of some of the characters, and what you know, why that is such a frequent vehicle for uh, poetic and lyrical expression. I suppose uh, that the disinhibition 
that often accompanies that is a, a really uh, handy vehicle for primary process thinking, for uh, poetics, for, you know, a sort of uninhibited narrative that can just sprout wings and take off and fly. So uh, I'm sure I'd have a much more uh, comprehensive answer if I, if I had time and I gave it some more thought, but um, that is definitely, uh, you know, something going on in our culture, in our literature, and in, in what, I, what we heard tonight. Thank you, it's a great experience. Uh, did either um, you guys, Fred or Bobby, uh, write any of this stuff while while high? Probably, I probably or high or drunk or something. I might be high right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, can you get to this stuff without getting high? Can oh, you... absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I wrote a poem in in this book that I was out uh, chopping wood. Actually, it's the one about the gorilla. My dad uh, being the gorilla, across, uh, you know, carrying me across the lawn. That poem is uh, was was very. I was very straight when I wrote that poem. Yeah. <laughs> Even though maybe uh, edits were done under the influence at some point, I don't know. Yeah. I'll, I'll say because I've been a film composer for tw over twenty years now as well. And um, I, I think both perspectives have their place and um, any advances I've made at moderation are really in the interest of not having to not be able to do it someday almost, you know? Um, sometimes I treat it as a, um, I mean, it's like another frame of mind. Um, and you get into me personally, I like to write with a clear mind, but I like to edit and revisit it, you know, after smoking a little bit because yeah. that's, you really have a certain, um, eye for catching something that you might have even like typos I tend to catch after I've smoked something you know what I mean where um it's just an embellishment yeah, yeah and there's been times where um you know I've been one time an example I was working on a piece of music for a film and, and there was a deadline and everything else and I was just you know like just rubbing it and rubbing you know like eventually breaking the skin and losing whatever the heck the thing is and just ready to really give up on it and um I smoked cigarettes at the time. I went outside to have a cigarette and saw my neighbor and he said, hey, we just made some pasta. My friend's in town. He's an architect. Come over, have a glass of wine. So I, I did and went over to these people that were complete non-musicians and just got absorbed into their talking about their creativity. We smoked a little joint. I went back to the studio after being like 10 hours on this thing, just completely straight minded. And I looked back at the thing, listened to it and cut out this instrument, changed that, did it like four little tweaks and that piece of music is the way that it is now on the soundtrack, you know? So, I mean, I think that it's great to have, to be able to do a shift, especially after you've done hours and hours, you know, at something and you still have to keep going because of schedules and that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I think it's disarming, which is good, but I think it also um, just gives you a different perspective. I don't know. I just Can I, can I mention one other thing here? Yeah. Uh, Okay, I'm sorry if I'm uh, interrupting. Uh, actually, and I'm sure you would agree with this, um, I think the door, you know, states of consciousness door swings both ways. And, and for so specifically, I remember back when I was actually a teenager, um, a pal of mine and I in the Bronx, um, we... <laughs> We, I don't know, we, you know, other kids are out playing, you know, hoop, shooting hoops and in schoolyards, stickball. We were, we were reading surrealist and Dada poetry. <laughs> For why, I don't, why, I don't know. That's a whole other discussion. But, you know, we, I found that uh, at that tender age, you know, if I was reading, um, you know, Rambo or uh, think surrealism that made, made you take these enormous leaps of faith and leaps of uh, associ association, associations, you know, the, the meeting of an umbrella and a sewing machine and an operating table kind of randomness that it actually engendered uh, like a kind of a trance 
and mm -hmm. kind of a a liberation from the you know signified and the signifier so it's like you were getting high from reading this shit you know yeah there's yeah. a lot of ways to change your brain chemistry yeah. through yeah. meditation yeah. through yeah. like you know um i've i've done weird stuff like method composing where i've had to write a something with some angst in it and maybe i balanced on one foot with my toes curled until it became painful i mean i've i've yeah. done different things to kind of um yeah. change your brain you can change your brain chemistry well, I, I just one last example of that is you know i always tried to understand what was going on with the the zen master and the zen koans you know that they make these poor students uh, these you know initiates uh you know ponder an imponderable uh you know um paradox mm -hmm. for 20 years until their mind goes into samsara and they just overcome all the cate logical categories and they get really high and they hit the light and everything so that's just, that's another example of what we were doing as uh little precocious kids you know with handling this this uh very powerful elixir of poetry yeah yeah uh, what were you gonna say fred a second oh, ago you know i i guess i'm not that deep that i really need to do anything other than <laughs> dig into my head uh about uh, and it's generally a subjective thing it's like with just an experience that i've had over time and i pull it out of my head and i write it i write a couple of paragraphs about that experience and then i poeticize from that from the prose generally mm -hmm. i don't I, I don't really you know i'm not i don't know what we're saying what we're talking about exactly <laughs> well, well I, I, I don't think that um creativity so i've written some of my best stuff completely sober and completely stone so i i don't i think that it's in you like i think that's what fred's alluding yeah, to i just don't have, i don't have, I, I never have a problem with writer's block because i can always pull some crap out of my brain right so, yeah generally and generally my prose is good enough where i can uh extract uh enough cool shit out of there that i can make something sound poetic yeah <laughs> i mean i can take po i can take prose and do that with that you know it's it's so simple yeah you don't you don't need a that's why that's why i create yeah you don't need the elixir catalyst. Not really. Yeah. But then again, like like you were saying, you can always embellish with with the drug. Yeah. You can That's expand. Good. You can expand with the drug. It's funny that I look at it more as an editing tool than a creative tool because you would think it would be kind of the opposite. You'd be tapping into it for inspiration, but for me, it's just a disarm. Like I said before, a disarming thing. Just this shift. But yeah. You know, also. Uh... I, I my, this will be my final comment. It would be interesting if we uh, could get Hunter S. Thompson on the phone. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, what is what is that, right? I mean, yeah. you read the stuff and you get a severe headache, you know, and you know what <laughs> what is he, you know, he I'm sure he has opinions about the use of drugs and writing. Yeah. I have a poem in this book that was pretty influenced by by Hunter Thompson. And, and those specific, and it's a story about me taking psychedelics in high school during class. And so it's a, you know, it reminded me of fear and loathing a little bit. But I don't know what to do about the fact that it's uh, it's eight o'clock, um, <laughs> and, and uh, this is not network television. But I think we we have been trying to keep this so as to not be scary either to audience or to participants yeah. at an hour. I, I found this very interesting. Uh, David is uh, one of our authors, um, uh, a novelist, a surreal novelist. <laughs> and um, um, anyway, the, this topic of where the, where the intelligence and the supra-intelligence interact in writing is very interesting to me. I have to say as my uh, closing line that I've never been drunk in my life. And um, no, that's not necessarily good. I've tried, 
but it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. I just go to sleep. And, you know, I've always felt in vino veritas and I've been blocked from my whole life from the veritas. Uh, so uh, I, I envy y'all who, <laughs> who can go beyond uh, into the vino, etc. cetera, uh, for your creativity. My mind comes sort of the way Fred was saying, actually mine comes from the characters that I'm interacting with uh, in my books. So, but um, anyway, let's, let's call it um, a, a fomite hour. I hope David will be on with us uh, for his uh, many experiences. Uh, we'll find a partner for you. And um, yeah, this is good. I'm, I'm, I, I think it was, you have any final comments? Just that uh, I'll have a recording up probably by tomorrow. Um, once right. I, I have to trim off the beginning and the end a little bit. Yeah. Make it look nice. <laughs> Well, and thank thanks you. for your input, David. I appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for okay. having us. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. Really nice. Really nice. Okay. See you in a month or so, whenever the next Thursday is. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Fred. Bye bye. Hey, take care. How do we get out of here? <laughs>